In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May your power come down upon this host and make it become for us the body and the blood of Christ. Okay, we'll meditate about a half hour.
Okay, you guys can start coming back and just uh, take your time. We will be in John one fifteen when we read. Okay, so we'll be in John chapter 1, verse 15, and just like I said last time, we will we'll read the rest of this chapter all the way to 2, and then we'll finish out the commentary on this chapter. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask Him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, saying, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, No. Then they said to him, Who are you, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were from the Pharisees, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered then, saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. 
Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again the next day, John stood with the two disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them said to him, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and then and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, so we'll just take, I'm not going to give you guys too much time, but just take a minute with that and see what stands out to you. Okay, okay, so we can begin the commentary on this 
on the scripture, the rest of chapter one. And there's, there's kind of a lot I want to say and, um, it, more than I can keep in order in my head, maybe. So I did take a little bit of notes. And so what I want to remind everybody is, and, and remember we're assuming nobody has read this or before. This is new to you. So, you know, every little, not every detail, but most of it. What What is John trying to say? And And hopefully you guys will remember these things so that when we read them in the future, you're absorbing all these layers of wisdom and power and meaning that you might miss if you if you don't remember these subtle things. And so so the Gospel of John is is concerned with who is Jesus. and And it says later that it was written so that you might believe in Jesus. And so this is what it's concerned with. The Gospel of John wants you to know who Jesus is and wants you to come to believe in him. And, um, you know, if you have read this many times and you're already on the path, don't don't take that as not a message for you. Remember, our faith grows. We grow in faith over time. Christ over time becomes more and more to us. I mean, we know that he is everything, but but, but don't you still sometimes find yourself in a moment of struggle wanting to turn somewhere other than Jesus, right? And, 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 and actually that's embedded in this first chapter because, uh, well, let me get on to who, so, okay, so who is Jesus, right? We talked about that last week. We know that Jesus is the incarnation of God. We know that. And we also know that in some ways, well, in massive ways, Jesus is a is a new movement of Judaism, a step forward. And, and you can tell that John really wants you to get that message because Moses and Elijah and Ezekiel are all mentioned in, in, in this first chapter. And so, and I wanted to say something just, this is just a random fact about Moses. And, you, you know, if you're Christian, you don't really get the full impact of who Moses is, but the Jewish people do get it. So you have to understand Moses is the, you know, the greatest figure in the Old Testament. And, and, you know, and you have to understand that the, the Jewish religion produces saints and, um, and, and sages and, and that it, and, and that Moses is their guy. And I thought, This isn't really a big thing. It's maybe nothing, but I thought you might want to hear this. When God appeared to Moses on Sinai, Moses heard even the words a disciple would say to his master. Think of that. So that means what they're saying with that that passage. This is from an ancient Jewish text that is not scripture. It's on commentary of the scriptures. And what they're saying is that when Moses saw God on Mount Sinai, he was touched so deeply and given so much knowledge that he knew what a Jewish disciple would say to his sage master when he confessed him. That he saw all of that from all peoples. So Moses, you, you know, we, we downplay Moses because Jesus is, is our great figure. And that's all true. But Moses is profoundly enlightened and reached a profound state of consciousness of God and a profound state of knowledge about the world and the people in it. And and so it this just goes, it bears mentioning and then and I'll go through the scripture I'm just going to kind of go line by line but I want to give you some background Elijah is also one of these great figures and and I thought just you know Elijah uh, raised people from the dead he worked a lot of miracles and he also never died he ascended into heaven without dying so that's quite enlightened I would say I mean that's not small that's a lot Elijah was a very very prominent figure in the Old Testament and, and I guess the, the thing I want to point out is that his main thing 
it, remember we talked about last week how it's kind of astounding that the Jewish peoples maintained their monotheism. But there were times when they would waver and then a prophet from God would come among the people and get them back on track. And, and Elijah is one of those prophets and he's a great prophet. And what was going on is, I think it's King Ahab was, and Jezebel were sort of getting back into polytheism and getting back into nature worship. And, you know, in the Old Testament, that's just, it's as sinful as it can possibly be. God is trying to get people to come to the one power above all things. But human nature, it's weak, and it wants something it can grasp, and it wants something it can turn to that's more tangible, and that's a weakness of human nature, and, and it's a disorder that God wants to cure. So God's got to raise these people up to a higher degree of sensitivity, a higher degree of consciousness and a higher degree of worship. And all along, they're trying to get, you know, they're, they're, they would waver and go back. And so, so, so Elijah was the prophet who accused, you know, all the kings really, because I think he, King Ahab was the last king of being sinful and having wavered back and forth with this monotheism to polytheism. Is God our God or is Baal our God? B-A-A-L, Baal. And, and that was the god of thunder and the god of, of dew and water and moisture and rain. And so you've got the Jewish peoples being, being cult, you know, cultivated by God through the prophets and through direct connection with the people, leading them towards monotheism, leading them to the one power that has all the other smaller powers in it, Right? So, so Baal is just this small God, right? There, there's all these different small gods. And, and, but think of it in your own life. When you are in need spiritually, where do you turn? Where do you turn? If you cheat and sneak, you know, uh, it, no one knows, right? But, you know, it, but it, why is it sinful? Why was it such a big deal? Because... You must turn to God in your time of struggle to grow closer to God. And that is all God was concerned with, with the, with the Jewish peoples of the Old Testament, was leading them to the one God, to consciousness of the one God and fidelity to the one God. That's all it was about. And so if God's entire purpose for this people is so that they can be an you know, uh, 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 a standout among human beings who have found a personal connection to the one God. If that's God's entire purpose for these people, to draw the whole world to a personal relationship with God through them, then yeah, going back to nature worship is a massive sin. It's a massive disorder and, 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 and it's a weakness, it's, an, it's a natural tendency in the human being that God is trying to purify the Jewish people and take them from. And that's what's going on. That's what's being referenced here. So that's who Elijah was. So, okay, so that's the background. on And then Ezekiel, I won't give much background on Ezekiel except that he had that vision, right? Ezekiel's ladder where he saw the ladder between heaven and earth, right? So, so, so these are three prominent figures from the Old Testament that are all being mentioned by John in the introductory chapter, which is, which is trying to lay the foundwork of this, who is Jesus? And remember, he's writing to Gentiles too, but Jews. So, and they know these connotations certainly better than I do. They know Moses, so, you know, Moses, I've read Jewish literature um, from, you know, like Hasidic masters, mystics. And, you know, the way they talk about Moses, it, 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 you really need to, I think, be exposed to that to understand how great Jesus is. If Jesus brings in a completely different order of spirituality that transcends what Moses had, you, you really don't appreciate that unless you know what Moses had, and Moses had a lot, right? To know 
every word that every disciple would speak to their master before they were born, that's, that's something quite profound. And there are many statements like that about Moses in, in the old, you know, in Jewish literature. So, so, okay. So that's a background. I hope this helps some of the characters. And then, and then we've got John the Baptist and, um, Jesus says of John the Baptist that among those born of men, that means, you know, of, of people, none were greater than John the Baptist. So, and, and later, John, Jesus even says that John is Elijah in a sense. So, so now he's saying John the Baptist is the greatest of those born of human beings. So Jesus is sort of placing John the Baptist above Moses, above Elijah, right? Um, maybe not above Melchizedek because Melchizedek had no parents. He wasn't born of people. Um, so, okay, so that's background. Then I want to read through, I, I, um, I won't give a lot of commentary today. I think you can tell by my voice that, that, that I'm sick. It's great that we're doing recordings. I would not be doing class otherwise. So this is just great. Um, so I, I won't maybe read as much as I, I normally would have. But let me, um, let me read. Let me just read through now. We'll go through the pieces. So, okay, so we're at 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So this is John telling you that another in order of spirituality entirely was brought by Jesus Christ. And this is John telling you that Jesus is greater than Moses. And not only that, but an entire new kind of spirituality is now being required of us. And we're moving away from strict observance of the law to this life of grace that comes from God. And that's, that's really, it's a big movement away and, and has massive repercussions for the Jewish people that are disciples of Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So think of this. John is saying the only begotten son, right? And the, and the Nicene Creed says begotten, not made. Who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. This is all language saying Jesus is God. It's all language, but it's also asserting Jesus's primacy over Moses, Now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, saying, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? So at the time of Jesus, before Jesus reveals himself to the public, you've got John the Baptist who is out in the desert baptizing people, and he's an ascetic. Um, he, he eats wild locust. It's a kind of grain and honey. And his garments are camel hair, and he has the camel hair turned inside out. And it's really itchy. And he does that because he is... Embrace the life of suffering and the life of repentance and, and, and a life solely devoted to God with no comfort. And, and, and he has a massive following and many Jewish people are coming to him. And John says that he is there to prepare the way of the Lord. So he's there to purify people. He's baptizing. And there's something interesting about his baptism He's baptizing Jews in water. And, 
And at the time, um, Jews didn't do that. In fact, it was being baptized in water by a Jew was what Gentiles did if they wanted to become Jewish. And, and, and him baptizing Jewish peoples was considered a, a real insult. It, 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 was, it was quite a thing to do. And, and it meant to them a, a kind of repentance, a new kind of repentance must come into our hearts because the Messiah, the Christ, the one that's foretold in the Old Testament, the whole thrust of the Old Testament leads to the Messiah who will come and reveal all things. And John says, I am the guy who comes before him to prepare his way. I'm that guy. And I am here to prepare his way. And so many, you know, probably thousands of people are coming out to John and being baptized. And he's saying, make straight the way of the Lord. And he's telling people to repent, right? To have a change of heart. And, and why is he doing this? It's so when Jesus comes, they're prepared to receive his power and his teaching. So, so John the Baptist, not John the author of the scriptures, John the Baptist, he's teaching and preaching repentance and he's baptizing people and he's preparing them. He's preparing the whole people for Jesus to come and bring his power and his light and his teaching and himself. And that's John's role. And, and Jesus says of him, you know, I already said that, but Jesus says of him, among those born of men, none is greater than John the Baptist. None. It's, it's not just some obscure figure out in the desert. This is, this is someone filled with power. And, and he's just there to make the way ready for Jesus. Okay, so we're moving on now. Um, okay, so the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he re remained upon him. And then a little later, again, on, on the next day, uh, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And, re and remember, I just read, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, so this is very significant. Um, in, in, in most of the world at this time, there were some sections where it had been transcended, but in most of the world, there was either animal or human sacrifice going on basically everywhere. You know, most cultures practiced it. And the Jews at the time, they don't do it now, but at the time they were still practicing animal sacrifice. So if you sinned, you would take a lamb and you would go to the temple and you would sacrifice the lamb to God. And now that sounds pretty brutal to us, and, and I, I suppose it is, but there's one of the ways you can mitigate how brutal that sounds is remember that if unless you're a vegetarian, you're also eating animals that were killed. So these animals were killed, and then the priestly class would eat them. So it, 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 it's not quite as terrible as it sounds, um, but, but nonetheless, so you're, you're in sin, the Jewish people's had come to this understanding that they had to sacrifice something to have their sins atoned for. So John the Baptist, before Jesus has preached, before, the G before Jesus has taught, before Jesus has revealed himself as the Messiah, as the Christ, before his disciples know it, 
John the Baptist looks at Jesus and sees and calls him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, of the world. And I got, I have to stop here because I, I think this is really the center of what I'd want to talk about because it isn't this the whole point. I mean, think about, that's the language, okay? The Lamb of God, and then you have to remember that the Jews sacrificed animals, and so, and that would make them, their sin forgiven. So now they're saying Jesus is the sacrifice and we know that he goes and he gets hung on the cross and dies. And that becomes the final sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the the complete and full sacrifice for all time, for all humankind. And that, and that it is to take the sin out of the world. And, and I just want to say that, you know, that isn't language. That is not language. That's not just words. That's the truth. And, 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 and at the center, you know, we, we really count on that. When, when someone new comes, all I'm waiting for is for them to start saying these certain things, right? Like I am noticing God is healing my pain or my suffering. They might not use the word sin depending on how, you know, what kind of background they have. But aren't we just waiting for the new people to get it, to get that Jesus Christ is in their life and to start to see the proof of it, to start to see their depression start to fade, to to start to see their anger start to diminish, to start to see their selfishness start to to, to pass. And, And isn't the night that we talk about so much just that major, and I mean, a lot of growth goes on before the night. But isn't the night that major initiation where someone comes to see that they have so much sin and so much disorder that there's no way they will ever get it cleaned up? And, and isn't the first part of the night just a letdown for people? They, they, they only become more aware of their sin. They only become more aware of how disordered they are. Whereas before they got on the path, they thought pretty highly of themselves, maybe. Now they, they're, they're thinking, they're rethinking all that. <laughs> and, and they're getting a lower and lower opinion of themselves. And their friends and family are not understanding and saying, hey, don't, you shouldn't be doing this path. Whatever you're doing, it's not working. It's making you worse. But, but some part of them can, in their heart, See that, no, it was always true that I was boisterous because I was covering up for insecurity and I was intellectual because I was covering up for insecurity and, and I was hiding because I was afraid if I said anything, I, it would reveal that I'm a fool. And I mean, was it all of my behavior just about me and sin completely, right? And so the night comes in and, 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 and they, you begin to see that, you're, that you actually lie constantly, like not where you're telling lies, but that every way in which you present yourself is a lie. It's all a lie. It's all to be something you're not, usually to cover up for something you're afraid you are. And 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 the night just begins to show a person this. They become more and more aware of how deeply disordered they are. And then and then what happens? At some point they realize, they start to realize there is no way they can fix it. Earlier on, they, they see it and get frustrated and try to hurry and get better, right? Like, uh, you know, i have starting to initiate someone into the night. I'll sometimes point out, you know, a pretty heavy thing to somebody that they don't know is there. And I, and I hope I'm careful enough about it, but I, I'll just start telling them, have you noticed this about yourself? Have you noticed this? Now, these are wounds. These are meant to wound the false self, and start to make it crumble. And that's a hard thing, you know, that that false self has to die. And so I could feel the Holy Spirit, you know, leading them towards this. So I'll start chipping away, you know, little pokes here and there that hopefully start to shatter that facade and, 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 and cause them to really look inwardly at the true nature of, of the disorder inside of them. But, you know, people that are extra new, 
they'll they'll try to come back the next week telling me how they fixed that already. <laughs> that they'll quickly try to put it away, quickly try to be past it. And and that's, you know, naivety and it's what new people do. And it's arrogance and it's pride and it's and it's really that person trying to protect the false self that needs to die and hurry and fix something so the false self can remain intact. And that's not a deep enough death, is it? That's not a deep enough transformation. So, so, so the night you know, begins to initiate a person into death, really. The death of the false self, um, at least the beginning of the death of the false self, and certainly a real and direct awareness of how sinful and disordered everything is. The whole way in which one presents themselves is it's based on approval of other human beings and it's based on cover up of insecurities and it's it's all dishonest. None of it is authentic. None of it is who the person really is in God. None of it. People start to see that, right? And and, and when they start to see it, for me, there's a big celebration and I usually tell them so. You know, a, a, a woman just recently told me a whole bunch of stuff about herself. She's starting to see there's a lot of disorder in there. And, and that sounds great to my ears. To my ears, that's a person who's got a chance at this, right? And, and, and that's why, like in other Gospels, Jesus' first words are, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, when Jesus says, Repent, come on, that's Jesus. He's not just talking. He's not like us, right? He's, he doesn't just say things that pop into his head. That's not Jesus. If Jesus said it, he meant it, and he meant it in profound ways that cut to the core of what a human being is and what humanity is, where a human being is and where humanity is. So his first words in in another gospel, not the gospel of John, is repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So, so here we have John the Baptist preparing people in this way for the Lamb of God who is going to take away their sin. And, you know, for us, um, this is not language. This is what we experience. This is what happens. And, and that's the next stage after someone starts to see how ugly they are. Um, and after they maybe stop trying to fix it or being scandalized by it, they start to calm down, right? It's, it's, it's a hard adjustment to find out you're completely full of it, right? That's just tough. And nobody, that's just not an easy thing to come to, but one must come to it to be a true disciple of Christ. And there are levels to which one can come to it, and we have to come to it. And, and so first we see someone close enough to God to notice that they're full of garbage all the time and that everything is a lie. And that's devastating to the false ego. So this is a hard experience, right? And then, and then we start to notice them trying to hurry and fix it, trying to solve it and getting frustrated and getting angry and then getting sad, self-pity and depression. We see all these swings, right? Back and forth with this. But then over time, they start to settle in and say, you know, okay, this is just true. And, and it's been true now long enough, right? Maybe, maybe a, a few months or a couple of years. That's true long enough that they begin to accept, yeah, this really is me. I am really a mess. And I, I can't dig my way out of this. That's crazy. They start to see it. And that's wisdom. And all that prepares for what? That prepares for asking Jesus to help, which can't be done when you're trying to deny it, which can't be done when you're trying to fix it yourself, trying to hurry and get it fixed by somebody, right? Right? all these things we do instead, you start to turn to Jesus. And you're in your, your good soil now, you've been tilled up, right? You've been roughed up. And this, this new seed of faith in Christ can be planted in you. 
And that's what you see as like the next stage in the night, which is people start to say, I, 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 I'm starting to feel a humility and I'm starting to notice a peace about this. And I'm noticing that these things are just starting to fade away, but I'm not the one making them go. And that is right. That's the beginning of a kind of true faith. So when John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that is not, that is not inconsequential language. That is, I mean, there's a few things you could say about Jesus that are just primary, but that is primary to who Christ is. His job is to take the sin out of the world. And that sin dwells in people. So his job is to take the sin out of people. And so and we and we know this because we see it happening. We know this because we see it happening. And many of us refuse to get help from anywhere else. We'll listen to people, of course, you know, especially people that are disciples of Christ. Um, but we, re, we, we turn to Christ alone because Christ is enough. And this is what who Jesus says is the greatest man to have ever lived. Sees in Jesus. And there's one more line that he says that, you know, he didn't know who he would be. And God said, and God said to him, it's the one upon the Holy Spirit will descend upon and remain and that is also profound language. You know, we overlook this language all the time, but that is profound language because in every other human being, the, the, the power of the Spirit ebbs and flows, right? It comes and it goes. And on, on Jesus, the power remains. Another statement that is not made out of just, you know, just because it popped into their head, so they said it. People do that. That's not what John the Baptist does, and that's not what Jesus does. So, so here it's, you're being told, the one upon whom God's power remains, it remains. And then one last, just a little thing, you know, John says in there, somewhere, I'm not going to pick it up and read it, but somewhere he says that God told him, the one that is preferred before him, um, but who came after him. And, and because John is older than Jesus. So John is actually born on the earth before Jesus. But he said, the one who came after me is preferred before me. And because he was before me. John says, because he was before me. And that means that John was even able to see Jesus's existence before his incarnation as a human being. Right? So he had insight into this, right? Before all things, right? That's in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and, and we know that, it, that that statement means before time was invented, before light was invented, before space was invented, before there was anything at all except God, Jesus was there. And John has some insight into this. Okay, so I do have to keep it short tonight. My, you know, I'm coughing and it's a little bit of a mess here. But there's one more thing that must be said. Oh, two more. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Um, there's actually three more things I got to tell you, but this is one of them. Now, we don't know for sure, but it, maybe Jesus saw him under the fig tree praying. Maybe. But it was a saying among the Jews at the time that was like a, a kind of figure of speech that meant you were praying, not under a fig tree though, right? So you were in your room praying. They would say, oh, you were, you were under the fig tree in your room praying. 
So it may be that Jesus saw Nathaniel praying in the inner rooms. And, and that's very possible because Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. So, Son of Man is one of the titles Jesus used to refer to himself. He used it because it, it, was, a, a, um, it was language that was messianic in its nature. People would know he was using messianic references to himself. But it was one of the references, one of the terms of speech that did not have military connotations. And so it seems to be his preferred way of saying I'm the Messiah, but don't look for me to be a military leader. So Ezekiel saw his ladder. He saw the way to heaven, right? The way from heaven to the earth and the way from earth to heaven, Ezekiel's ladder. Here is Jesus saying, I am the ladder. I am the ladder between heaven and earth. I am the way. Just another one of Jesus's profound statements about who he is. That he just drops on people and waits for them to come to understand a couple of years later. Right? At first, it's scandalous to them. He's making profound claims about himself. Many, as we know, of the claims he makes about himself will get him killed. That the, There is a death sentence for some of the things he is saying. But he's saying them anyway, right? And they're going to kill him for it. And he's going to be the Lamb of God when they kill him. He's going to be the final perfect sacrifice for humanity. It all works out. Their sin rages up and they want to kill Jesus for saying these things, the, the elite of the Jews, right? The elite religious leaders, they want to kill him for saying he is who he is. And, and Jesus is saying the things he's saying because it's going to get him killed and they're going to kill him. But then unwittingly and unknowingly that becomes the final sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice needed. And, and we know there's so much in there. I don't know. I don't think I'll go into it tonight. I've made a whole video on it before about Jesus having taken all of the sin of the world upon himself and dying with it in him. And that somehow the germ, sometimes they use the word the germ, the germ of sin, the seed of sin was put to death and it's all on its way to fading out in Christ. And when you accept Christ into your life, or when you accept him into your life on a deeper level, when you grow in faith, and you must grow in faith, then Jesus takes another level of that in your soul, right? And it's, and it's received in humility, and it's not something we do, and it's not something we accomplish. It's something that is done in us it's not something we end up bragging about. It's something we end up being deeply grateful for. It's not something we grasp, but it is something we receive. We receive Christ. One more um, little bit. So the first words that Jesus speaks in this gospel to disciples is, what do you seek? And don't pass that up. You, the, he's asking you, what do you seek? What do you seek? What 
What do you seek? Okay, short class tonight. Maybe it makes up for last time's long class. Uh, thank you all very much. We can meet on Zoom after. I may or may not be there. I'm I'm quarantined away from the family right now. I've taken a COVID test. Won't get the results till tomorrow. Um, but right now I'm living in the center. And just in case it's something, uh, I have some symptoms. So uh, I may sleep. But um, please meet on Zoom. And, um, and I hope if you're new, I hope this helps you have a deeper understanding of the Gospels. Now, we've just swallowed the entire first chapter now of John. And the first chapter is, who is Jesus and what is he here for? And I feel that anybody that is a Christian and anybody that's a member of the center really should spend some time meditating upon these notions and these ideas. There's a time to lay back and not go into deep meditation and to think about what it means for Jesus to be what he is, right? Uh, both as God incarnate, as fully human, uh, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as the bringer of light to all peoples. It, it, you have to wrap your mind and your heart around this and it has to become your own. You have to come to know that in your heart and participate in that. That is the path of a disciple of Christ. And we turn away from the multiplicity, right? The, the nature gods, the, Baal, sun god, and the moon god, you know, the crystal healers, you know, the money, the success, right? The way people view us, our status, our standing, who we want to rub shoulders with. We turn away from all of this and we turn to Christ and God alone. And in that, we find our perfect stability, our perfect security, a capacity to let go of our guard and be truly present in life. All of that is in Christ. And when you suffer, it it helps you to turn to Christ. It's better if we don't turn to something to fix it. Something that might temporarily make us feel better, but that in the end does not bring us closer to God. Because in Christ is all things. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Okay, thank you all. Um, please donate uh, uh, Venmo. Thank you very much for all the donations. And uh, please meet on Zoom. And if I'm not there, um, just please remember to you speak for the new people, right? We Remember that last thing I said last week? You speak for them. You speak for them. They need to hear it. And, um, you know, try to keep it to less than five minutes. <laughs> Unlike me. Okay, thanks you guys very much.